Hello. Well, this is our final module lecture on Energy 101, and I'd like to do a quick wrap-up and uh, overview today to kind of see what makes some sense out of all of these details and all of the uh, uh, deep dives that we've done and looking at a lot of detailed information. So. Uh, I'm going to flash through a lot of it because we've seen the slides and spent a significant amount of time on them. I just want to uh, remind us of, of the information that we have and try to put a wrapper on it here at the end. Uh, so uh, what are the energy issues? Why are we even interested in e energy? Why is it a major uh, issue in the news and political issue and world issue? Well, in the U.S., it's for two reasons. Number one, carbon emissions, and number two, oil, independent, oil dependence, where we're dependent upon oil produced outside the U.S. that we have to buy at about a billion dollars a year uh, going out of this country. And uh, so those are the two primary issues. There's some other smaller issues. For instance, the smog issue due to nitric oxides and hydrocarbon emissions from uh, power plants and from automobiles. Uh, we've made a lot of headway on that, and I won't say it's solved, but uh, having been, lived in the Los Angeles area back around 1970, it was uh, really uh, difficult. And you go out there now, and it's a whole other world. So in the same way in Atlanta. So we've made a lot of headway on a lot of the energy issues. But these are the two big ones that we're faced with now. Carbon emissions that is uh, dealing with, car with climate change and oil independence. So I just want to refocus and uh, understand why we're looking at all this. Uh, the carbon dioxide issue, I think, is uh, best described or best shown by uh, this slide right here. Uh, by here's the metric tons over here. Metric tons uh, that is emit of carbon that's emitted each year by different countries. And notice China. This is China, uh, and this is the U.S. The next one's the U.S. Uh, and carbon emissions are a worldwide issue. It's not like uh, smog. Smog was a local issue, and still is in so to some degree. It takes place in the urban areas in Los Angeles, Atlanta, New York, etc. But uh, you go out in the country 30 miles away and it's fine. So it's a, that was, smog was a local issue. Carbon dioxide is an international issue, world issue. Uh, when uh, we emit carbon dioxide that changes the climate in Europe, in Japan, in China, everywhere, and vice versa. So. Uh, uh, we have to look at not just the U.S., but everywhere. And what's frightening to me about this chart is, as you can easily see, is uh, where China is headed. Uh, they have three times more people than we have. They're trying to get their population up on the uh, economic curve and lifestyle you know, comforts that we have. And to do that, they're having to utilize a lot of energy and, and produce it quickly. So all the other countries, you notice, are down here. Now, when you add all these up, they are significant. Don't get me wrong. But uh, you have to add a lot of them up to equal either the U.S. or China. And uh, so w we need everybody's help. But if we don't get the cooperation of China and do something ourselves, then we're in, we're in deep trouble. Notice that the U.S. Uh, dropped here, and that, as we noted, due to mostly the economic recession that we were in, and now the recession is coming out, it's beginning to pick back up. Uh, we, we have gotten more efficient, but anyway, th this, this shows why carbon dioxide is, is a problem, and uh, we need to face the, the facts about how we can deal with that. Uh, the second one is U.S. oil de dependence, and this is best shown by this graph, which uh, I use a lot. And this shows the uh, whoop. this shows the uh, 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 
the red is the oil imports, and the uh, yellow is the U.S. oil production in the lower 48, and this, the magenta, is the uh, Alaska oil production. And just as we had a big increase in oil production in Alaska back here in the 80s, late 70s, we've had a big uh, increase in oil production in the lower 48. So you notice no find lasts forever. Every, all oil deposits are finite. Uh, everybody, there's only a finite amount of oil uh, in the ground. Now, if we spend more money, we can get more of it out, but uh, be, then it becomes an economic issue. But we've seen this kind of increase before. We saw it in the Alaska find, and that is diminishing in uh, 20 years later, 30 years later, you can see that uh, we get a much smaller amount than we did back here in the heyday of the Alaska oil production. Uh, but uh, the, the problem is, of course, the, uh, the imports, which are represented by the red. And, of course, up here is the uh, total U.S. consumption. And uh, we've, again, leveled off due to the economic era. So those are two charts that I think both summarize the issues that we have to deal with in carbon emissions and oil dependency. Uh, I'm going to flash through, well, this first. Well, so what can we do to solve these issues? Number one, we've got to understand the energy system details. We can't solve a problem until we understand the details. And then we need to develop the energy technologies, and develop means commercialize them, not scientific research in the lab. We need that, and we need to continue doing that. We're doing that and need to continue and probably do more of it. But those are long-term solutions that, that hopefully will come to the commercial marketplace 20 years from now. Uh, and then we've got to deploy the solutions. So it doesn't do any good to develop the technology if we don't deploy it. But this, is, this, this requires policy. And I hadn't said much about policy, but I'm going to uh, mention it uh, today. Because, uh, number one, why didn't I mention it? Because I'm a technologist. I'm not a policy expert. But uh, no matter what, what kind of technology we develop, uh, it's all for naught unless we deploy it, and, and we're not going to deploy it unless we have a policy. And uh, that's, that's the, the new takeaway from this summer. Uh, so just flashing through with the energy system details that we've covered, uh, we, we, I divided them into three categories. Number one, the society's use, uh, what we use the energy for, uh, where, where we get it from, the, we have to get it from the, a natural source somewhere, and then the, the process to convert it from the natural form we find it to the form that, that we want it to make our lives better. So we've covered all three of these boxes and different categories, but uh, different times, but that uh, uh, is, is the sum and substance of the, the three parts of our energy system in the U.S. as well as most countries. And uh, so what, what are the conversion process laws? Uh, just flashing back, the, the, we have some laws that say you can't just convert uh, one energy to another and, without some restrictions. Uh, the first law says that total energy uh, cannot be created or destroyed. We talked about that. And uh, this is called the first law of thermodynamics, just like the total mass uh, cannot be created or destroyed. It's the exact same scenario. And the second law says that all forms of energy do not have equal value. Now, one thing I probably didn't stress, when I said equal value here, I'm not just talking about economic value. I'm talking about thermodynamic value. For instance, you can't burn coal or natural gas or oil and convert 100% of that thermal heat energy into a high fo higher form of energy uh, th like electricity. That's what the second law tells us. And it's just a natural law, so we have to, uh, to upgrade energy, upgrade some of that heat to a higher grade like uh, heat to electricity, we have to downgrade some of it. So that's the reason we have to throw a lot of the energy away that from combustion 
when we put it into a power plant to generate electricity. Uh, the analogy there is an ounce of gold has more value than an ounce of silver, not just economically, but also, in this case, thermodynamically and how we use it. Uh, so energy use, where do we, the other box is uh, on the right-hand side, is where do we use energy? Uh, it's approximately a 50, a third, a third, a third split. We have buildings for heat and, heat, to heat and cool our buildings. We have manufacturing process to make the products we want, and we have uh, transportation. So those are the three sectors we have to deal with, and uh, we've talked about each one of those. Another, another major point is we cannot have economic growth of any significance without an energy uh, increase. And the best way to decrease energy consumption and decrease CO2 emissions is to have an economic recession. And that's exactly what happened here, uh, where we're, we're talking about the change from one year to the other. This is the percent change in the energy consumption and the gross uh, uh, national product for the uh, U.S. And you can see it, that the uh, economy dropped, uh, gross national product, and the uh, energy consumption dropped. So when it goes up, when the economy is growing, our energy consumption is growing. Uh, and we, we really, we can ameliorate that somewhat, but we're a little bit stumped as to how we can ever decouple that. Uh, oil imports, again, is the other issue here, and this just shows the trend. Uh, we are making some headway recently due to the increased oil production and decreased uh, oil use. Uh, and here since the recession, but it has started to, it hadn't started clicking up yet. It's come up a little bit in uh, the last several months, but uh, not dramatically. So there's some, the trend is in the right direction, but we've seen that before. This drop was due to oil uh, going up by a factor of three or four in price back in the late 70s, early 80s, and the U.S. power plants getting off of oil for electricity. So we saved a lot, but that was a one-time effect. Uh, so why do we need oil, since oil is the problem? Well, we use oil, so we, need to look, we looked at how we use oil. We, uh, transportation dominates it, with uh, manufacturing being a, uh, number two by a long, long ways back. Uh, and then we, uh, we, one of the points that I that I made was that there's a confusion a lot of times regarding oil versus petroleum. And you're seeing a lot about petroleum use and imports rather than oil. But petroleum includes oil, natural gas liquids like butanes, propanes, ethanes, et cetera, and ethanol. And uh, those uh, ethanol used in cars does displace oil on a one to, almost on a one-to-one -one basis, on a 1.3-to-1 uh, one basis or so. But uh, natural gas liquids doesn't really displace, displace oil. So we need to understand the difference there when you read something, whether they're talking about petroleum imports and independence or oil of, uh, independent, independence. There, there's the difference, and we talked about that. Ethanol. Uh, is one that, as I said, displaces oil, not on a one-to-one -one basis because a gallon of e ethanol or a barrel of ethanol will not displace a barrel of oil because it has about 30 percent less energy. But uh, there's been dramatic growth in ethanol uh, out here, and you can see that uh, it's gone from about 300,000 to almost a million up here just in the last five years or so, six years, had a dramatic increase, but it's still fairly, it's a, a, a little over 5 percent of our uh, transportation, uh, which is where it's used. That's, but that's, that's corn ethanol, and there's some issues with corn ethanol. It really doesn't do much for our CO2 reduction because of the energy used to produce the ethanol. And 40% of our corn grown in this country is used for ethanol, driving up the prices of food. So there's some issues with ethanol. Uh, but ethanol is a petroleum fuel, and this shows the petroleum uh, production that includes ethanol uh, here, 
natural gas liquids that come out with natural gas and you compress them in their liquids uh, and oil. So uh, sometimes natural gas liquids and ethanol are included as in the petroleum lump with oil and people do that for their own purposes basically to try to make a point they want to make. And sometimes it's legitimate and sometimes it's very misleading. So you just need to be aware of the difference between petroleum and uh, oil. Uh, and regarding imports, uh, energy independence is still about oil uh, out here. Oil, oil, oil. Uh, you can see this is the uh, energy used by that we energy we use the U.S. uses for uh, in crude oil and natural gas and natural gas liquids and coal and in renewables and the blue is what we produce in this country and the uh, magenta is what we import and actually if it's below zero like it like our coal is that means we're actually exporting so we're exporting a little bit of coal and uh, generating a lot more. Uh, but oil, you can see, uh, this is outside the U.S., uh, oil is, uh, we're Im importing about 60% of our oil, 50-60%, depending on whether you want to, to count North America or the U.S., and there's a lot of nuances there. You have to dig into the details. But uh, we do import some natural gas, and that's dominantly from Canada, which is a, a stable source, and there's not much of it uh, also. So we're in pretty good shape in everything but oil is the point that we saw there. Uh, what about shale gas? Well, uh, you see a lot of what I call hype about shale gas and for a lot of good reasons and valid reasons, but I just wanna, wanna point out this last point that's one of my favorite uh, things I've learned, not favorite, but one of the truisms I've learned over my long life, and that is things are rarely as good or as bad as they first appear. So shale oil, uh, shale gas, shale gas uh, initially uh, was estimated to have a reserve of about 800 trillion cubic feet that was down there to be recovered from uh, sh shale and horizontal drilling and frac fracking. Uh, they, in 2011, they all of a sudden dropped it to, to less than 500. Uh, dramatic drop. And uh, that was because the U.S. Geological Survey uh, didn't agree with uh, EIA's estimate of 827. And EIA admitted that the U.S. Geological Survey probably knew better than they did, and uh, they dropped the number. So, it, you know, it's uh, how much is there and what the economics will be of the long term and the environmental consequences of fracking and getting it out. It is yet to be determined, but it's a large source that uh, hopefully we can get, get economically and uh, utilize. Uh, so the conclusions on energy independence is U.S. is dependent on imported oil, uh, but the U.S. is independent for coal and gas for all its essential purposes. So that means our electric power is uh, coming from a fuel source that we produce, but uh, our oil consumption primarily in transportation is not. Uh, and one thing we've got to realize is that this oil that we're dependent upon is uh, we're not in control of the price. Uh, that's controlled by primarily Saudi Arabia, uh, which dominates OPEC, and uh, uh, it, it's, it, price of oil is set by the world supply and demand. So if we increase or when we increase oil production, it does not uh, have a significant effect on world price because our production is still a small percentage of the world's. And when, if we increase production and cause the price, to, world price, to go down, uh, Saudi Arabia, the middle, some OPEC countries will decrease, uh, and they've shown this over and over again, uh, decrease production to offset it and keep the supply about the same. So it does make us more independent by when we increase production, but it doesn't have a significant impact on, on the par price that we pay. Uh, so the concluding point here is that regarding oil independence or energy independence is that there are no silver bullets for energy independence. We've got a lot of work to do, and there are some things we can do about it, uh, and uh, we'll uh, look at those further. Uh, what about carbon emissions? 
Well, the bottom line on carbon emissions is that uh, we can, we, if we generate solar, use solar, wind, and nuclear for electric power generation, then we will reduce carbon emissions because we'll be getting them from those clean uh, carbon sources rather than uh, coal and natural gas, in particular natural gas being cleaner than coal. Another thing we can do is hire mileage vehicles. That, through, thanks to policy, is in the works. We're uh, bump, bumping our uh, required mileage standard on vehicles in this country up to 20, up to uh, 55 miles per gallon by uh, 2025. And uh, we started having mileage requirements back in the 70s when my, the vehicle mileage was about 12 or 13 miles per gallon. Uh, so now it's in the high 20s, depending on how you count it. And uh, we're, we're scheduled to go to 55. Uh, that's technologically is certainly possible. Europe essentially is already there in the vehicles they have. Uh, another option is cellulosic ethanol for transportation. That comes from things like uh, pulpwood and trees or grasses. And uh, so that, that's, that's got a ways to go to become economically viable, however. But it, there's a lot of work in some commercial plants opening up. And of course, higher efficiency in electric heating and air conditioning is, is a primary thing that uh, can be done that reduces our electrical consumption and thereby reduces carbon emissions. Uh, there, there are minimum, EP, minimum DOE, EPA, uh, efficiency standards for space heating and equipment and air conditioning equipment, just like their minimum uh, efficiency requirements on, in miles per gallon for our vehicles, and those have made a big impact. We've moved the efficiency up of things like refrigerators and the air conditioners and the uh, heating systems up dramatically, and, and lighting also, and we, gotta, we can even uh, continue to improve that. There again, that's energy policy. That's a minimum efficiency standard that's set by the uh, Department of Energy and EPA. Uh, the option, of course, is uh, for electric generation that's clean of carbon is uh, photovoltaics. Uh, we, one nice thing about these people like is each, uh, each homeowner, if it's on their home, ha owns their own power generation plant. It's difficult to have enough roof air to supply all of your power, but you can make a big dent in it. Uh, central power towers, it has the characteristics of a central utility station, power generation station, such as a natural gas, such as a natural gas power generating plant or a coal power generating plant. But uh, it uh, uses the sun reflected off the mirrors and up to a central boiler and it boils the water uh, from the sun, uh, heat rather than from the combustion of fuels. Uh, Regarding, regarding wind and solar, there's the one point I want to make here. I'm going to show you two maps. That's the, uh, th this one is the wind map, and this one is the solar map. W one, one point I probably didn't, uh, I don't think I made, a, uh, made in, originally when we went through this, is that the wind power density varies from region to region in the U.S. by a factor of 10. In other words, if you look out here, uh, if you look out there, the wind uh, density is, uh, energy density is about 10 times what it is over in here. You notice the south and the east uh, is all green, uh, pretty much green. The darker the green, the less there is. And so the, the wind energy is primarily out here from an economical collection viewpoint, generation viewpoint, is out in the Midwest. So that's why most of the wind power plants are out there. Uh, that's, that's not true with uh, solar. Uh, notice for solar it's much more uniform. And here the kilowatts hours per day that falls on a fixed area is, uh, uh, it goes only by about a factor of two from four to about seven. So it is better out here in the southwest than you have in, the, for instance, the southeast, but it's not a factor of 10 like wind energy. So there is a much more uniform opportunity for solar 
energy ge electric generation uh, across the nation uh, than there is wind generation. Uh, and uh, so just in summary for the U.S. energy sources, the point I want to wrap up here with this slide is that we are dominated by coal, natural gas, and oil utilization. This is the percent of our energy that we get from each of those sources. And, uh, and then we've got uh, wind over here, and we've got solar over here, and we've got hydro, and we've got biomass. You can see we've got a long way to go to replace this big chunk that of energy we get from coal, natural gas, and oil that produces our uh, carbon emissions uh, to replace them by our renewable and uh, clean uh, energy sources. Uh, this represents trillions of dollars of infrastructure, and you don't, uh, a whole country doesn't walk away from trillions of dollars of investment and replace it with uh, trillions of dollars worth of uh, energy conversion processes that, and equipment that uses the renewable energy. It can be done, but there's huge economic penalty to pay. When the U.S. in the economic situation that they're in and debt, that's uh, debatable whether, whether we have the will or the financial resources to make that happen. Uh, so again, the U.S. energy issues are carbon emissions and oil dependence. And the one thing I want to emphasize here on this final wrap-up is that I haven't said much about, but I want to stress the importance of it, is that we need energy policy. We need a comprehensive energy policy. It needs to be implemented and executed, but that policy has got to be based on facts. What this course has been about is trying to talk about the facts. I'm not a policy expert, and that's the reason I've uh, stuck with the facts, but uh, we, we cannot make much headway without a comprehensive energy policy. But that policy's got to be made, it got to be based on facts. So much of the policy that we have are, is, uh, uh, is uh, dominated by uh, lobbyists to, to Congress for lobbying for different industries. And they're not interested in the national good, particularly in a lot of cases, but their own industry's good. For instance, be it the nuclear industry, be it the solar industry, be it the wind industry, be it the oil industry or the coal industry, each one is up there lobbying for an energy policy that helps their industry. And uh, that's unfortunate because uh, we need, need to understand all of, the, all of this uh, energy facts and uh, be able to, to di dissect the statements that are made and that we read so much of, so, a lot of which are misleading at best. So it's been great, and uh, I've enjoyed uh, being with you, and I hope that uh, I'll see you again. Take care.